So today we're going to start a new unit. This is over um, Europe. So we last talked about Europe back when we were studying which empire? Roman Empire, okay? And then we went and studied the Islamic world, and now we're back in Europe in period three. So chapter nine is all about the Byzantines and Russia, and so that's what we're going to focus on uh, the next two days. So this is a map of Constantinople. Um, Constantinople is located right where that arrow is. What would be the advantages of building a major city here? A lot of trade. Yes, definitely it's a crossroads of trade. Anything else? It's it, like, I forgot what the, it connects to like, yeah, so there's like a little strait there. It controls the entrance to the Black Sea. So it's also important um, militarily. Like it would be a good place to set up a base and from which to defend your empire. I was going to say it's probably easier to defend. Yes. Exactly, good. Okay, so since we haven't talked about Europe in a while, we're going to go back and just review a little bit kind of how this connects to what we've already learned. So, um, remember, way back in the Roman Empire, the empire was divided into two. Why did they divide it into two? Yeah, it became so big that it was hard to control, and so Diocletian divided it in two to try to make it easier to control. Which half fell? The western half was much weaker economically. It had a lot more invasions, and so that was a continual problem. Constantinople, which became the capital of the Byzantine Empire, was established as the capital of the Eastern Roman Empire by Emperor Constantine back in 330 CE. Okay, so here's a map that just reviews what's going on here. So the western side stayed as the Roman Empire with its capital at Rome. Bless you. Um, the Eastern Empire had its capital at Constantinople. That would go on to become the Byzantine Empire. All right. What I'd like you to do is shift to the source, primary sources. So this is a series of primary sources that's going to take us through pretty much everything we need to know about the Byzantine Empire. And we're just going to do a couple today. And then on Thursday, you'll have a lot of time to work on them. So document one... This is by what kind of person? A Roman historian. It's written in 450. Was the Roman Empire still a thing in 450? Yes, yes it, it died in 476. Okay, and it's about the Emperor Constantine. So the question on your paper, according to the document, what steps did Constantine take to ensure Constantinople was a splendid city that was well protected? Go ahead and read document one list everything you see that he did. There's a lot of things, so just make a list of bullet points. Did he what? Just the things that he did. Yes. Okay, so hopefully from that source you got that Constantinople Constantine really intended, intended this to be a magnificent city, like something that could compare to Rome, um, which had been considered, you know, the greatest city in the world by people living in this region. Okay, so back to our notes. Um, Constantinople, what made it really good and interesting here is that it was heavily fortified. So like we talked about with the map a few minutes ago, it's surrounded by water on three sides. It kind of is out on a little peninsula. And then they built a, a very heavy city walls to protect the rest of it. So it was a really good center of defense. Another thing that you'll read about, especially in the chapter, is that Constantinople was a multi-ethnic city. So people of all different ethnic groups lived in the Byzantine Empire and generally lived peacefully together. Another difference between it and the Western Roman Empire was that we know that what was the official language of the Roman Empire? Latin. Latin, okay. People in the East tended to speak Greek and they used that as their official language. Wait, that said Constantinople. That was 
Oh, okay, yes. So officially when it was under the when it was still under the Roman Empire, it was Latin and then they changed it over time. Good question. Okay, and this just shows you the remnants of one of those city walls. Um, so it was very well defended. So we know eventually West, the Western Roman Empire fell to the Germanic invaders, and the Western Roman Empire ended in 476 CE. Constantinople and the Eastern Roman Empire continued on. It has been renamed now the Byzantine Empire. In this time period, the people thought it's still the Roman Empire. But historically now, we call it the Byzantine Empire to show that there's this division in time. All right, so here are some of the basic characteristics of the Byzantine Empire. They were pretty good at resisting invasion. They were invaded a lot of times, and they did lose a lot of territory due to those invasions, but they still lasted as an empire for a thousand years because they started in 476 CE. They didn't end until uh, 1450 CE. They had a good tax base, meaning they had lots of um, trade going on that they could tax. They had lots of agriculture going on that they could tax, and that helped fuel their government. Commerce flourished, so there's a lot of trade going through here. They had a lot of artists in production. The Greek language and culture became dominant, so they really, after the Western Roman Empire fell, became very much associated with Greek culture. And one of the things that they're also known for is preserving all the learning from Greece, Rome, and the Hellenistic cultures. So once the Western Roman Empire fell, Western Europe was in chaos. Like people weren't really concerned about philosophy and the arts and stuff like that. And so it's due to these other cultures keeping that information secure that it still exists today. What's another culture we've learned that also preserved learning from these civilizations? Yes, the Islamic civilizations that we just studied did a similar thing. And then another key characteristic is they practiced Orthodox Christianity, which I'll talk about what that means. So here's how the Byzantine government was set up. It was highly centralized with an emperor. So. They kept the whole idea of the emperor going after the Roman Empire fell. And the emperor was the head of the church and the state. So there's no division in the Byzantine Empire between religion and government. The emperor appointed the patriarch, who was the bishop of Constantinople. So he's like the head of their church. The Byzantines also divided their empire into provinces, which they called themes or themata. And governors were put in charge of each theme to keep order and collect taxes. Why do empires tend to, do, to divide into provinces? What good does that do? Yeah, it's easier to control if you have governors who can monitor the local area. They also had a very strong bureaucracy. So they had a civil service exam. Where else have we seen that? In China. Uh, they had a civil service exam and the people who took that test had a be fluent in things like the works of the classical Greeks and Romans. That's the kind of stuff that they tested. So technically, just like in China, the Byzantine bureaucracy was open to anybody of any social class, but the bureaucrats tended to only be from the aristocracy. Why would that be the case? Yeah, because if you have to pass this test, I mean, you have to be educated, read and write, have access to education, and most people don't have that. So even though it's open to everybody, it tended to just be the wealthy that served in it. All right, the first major emperor that you need to know is Justinian. Justinian is significant for a number of different things. And he's ruling in the 500 CE, so really like very shortly after the Western Roman Empire fell. Um, he rebuilt Constantinople after a series of riots. He built the Hagia Sophia, which is a very famous church, which we'll look at in a minute. He also reconquered lots of Roman territory. So 
Justinian and the Byzantine people, like I said a few minutes ago, really believed that they were just a continuation of the Romans, like they were still the Roman Empire. Um, and so he wanted to reestablish what the Roman Empire had been, which didn't really work out, but that's what his goal was. And then probably most significant is Justinian's Code. The official name of Justinian's Code is the Body of Civil Law. And this is important because, again, Western Europe at this time was in chaos. It was under invasion by all these different tribes. The eastern part, they're preserving the rule of law. So Justinian's Code took Roman laws and standardized them and preserved them. And a lot of laws we have even today are still based on this. So it kept that idea of the rule of law going in Europe even while the West was in chaos. Okay, this is the Hagia Sophia. Um, this is a church in Constantinople, and today it's, the city is called Istanbul. So this was built as a monument to Christianity. It's supposed to be like built as one of the most beautiful churches ever built in all of Christianity. Um, this is what it looks like from the outside and inside today. Now, in 1453, the Byzantines were overthrown by the Ottoman Turks, who are Muslim. And so today, and they changed it into a mosque. So today, that's what it is, um, and that's why they've added those towers. Does anybody remember what those are called in Islam? Pillars. The minarets, and there's a guy who goes at the top of the minaret, and what does he do? He prays. He says, like, it's time for the call to prayer, right? Okay, so that's why it looks like that today. Those were not original to it. In a lot of these, there's... Um, See how there's kind of like a balcony halfway up the pillar? It's like where he would go. Now today, today these they have like a loudspeaker that does this. It's not probably a real person, but that was the idea. Okay, so this just shows you um, Justinian's territory. The Byzantine Empire is in pink. So that's what it was when he took it over. And then he added that orange territory, trying to recreate the Roman Empire, but it didn't really last. The territory was lost a few years later. Okay, so the Byzantines are really known for a lot of their artwork. They have very specific styles. So here's a mosaic of Justinian and attendants. And let's just do a little analysis here and see what's going on. Um, Justinian is in the middle. He's dressed in purple and gold. What do you think that symbolizes? Yes, those are the colors of royalty. Now, on the far left, what kind of people are standing by him? Military. Yes, definitely military. And then on the far right of him, oh what, what kind of people are there? Priests. Yes, so priests are there. They have the different things they need to um, give the sacraments. Okay, so what does that say about Justinian as a leader? Yes, and that in the Byzantine Empire, the emperor is in charge of everything, not just the military. He's in charge of religion and enforcing Christianity as well. So the Byzantines had a lot of threats to them over time. Um, and you can just list some of the groups that they had issues with. So the Arabs, who we just studied, were constantly trying to invade the Byzantine Empire and take away territory because they're right next door. They're both in the Middle East. Um, so that started around the 600 CE. In the 800s, they continued to have problems with Arab invasions and Slav attacks. Slavs are people like a different ethnic group from Eastern Europe. Then you can see they started to have invasions by the Seljuk Turks, the Crusades, which we'll learn about this week, and eventually Constantinople, Constantinople fell to the Ottoman Turks in 1453. So one of the major issues that the Byzantines faced throughout their whole history is invasions and people stealing territory from them. All right, now we're going to talk about Christianity in the Byzantine Empire. So 
Over time, there were differences that naturally evolved between Christianity in Western Europe and the Byzantines. They developed different rituals. The Byzantines didn't like papal influence. Whenever we see the word papal, what does that mean? It means the Pope. Who's the Pope? Head of Christianity. And at this time, there's only one version of Christianity. Like today, we have all these different churches and denominations. At this time, it's just one. It's just Catholic. That's it. That's all that exists. Okay, so the Pope is over all of that. Remember, the Byzantine emperor sees himself as the head of church and state. So he wants to be in charge of the church within his empire. He doesn't want to listen to the Pope. So that's a major disagreement. Um, they also appointed their own head bishop, which was called the Patriarch, which, like, the Pope is supposed to be the head bishop. Um, they also had disagreements over the use of icons, the marriage of priests, and communion practices. In the Catholic Church, do priests get married? No. no. So one of the issues was over icons. Icons are religious images, um, like these images of Jesus here. Um, throughout their history, they had disagreements over whether icons should be used or not. People liked icons because they felt like, especially at this time, a lot of people can't read or write. And so different pictures help people kind of identify with stories of the Bible and things like that. Um, but other people felt like icons went too far and people actually started worshiping the icons, which is not what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to worship God in Christianity. Um, and so they had disagreements over that. So, for example, in 730, the Byzantine emperor tried to ban the icons. The people revolted. The icons came back. But all these differences resulted in the official split of Christianity, which is called a schism. That means split. In 1054. So from that point on, Christianity was divided. In the west, they had Roman Catholic. In the East, they had Orthodox Christianity, which was the Byzantines. Um, these show kind of how the Byzantines thought about their role in the church. Um, so a lot of Byzantines, Byzantine icons show Christ as the Pantocrator or ruler of the world. So like if you look at this image, for example, of Jesus on the right, how does his expression compare to other images you might have seen of Jesus in the world? He, he looks like very stern, right? <clears throat> and so this kind of relates to the Byzantines because, remember, they view religion and government together. So the emperor is supposed to be the leader of the church, but then also enforce the rules and like keep order. So that's why... In this picture, Christ looks kind of like very stern and like he's going to be tough with you and make you follow the rules. They have a different interpretation. These are some of the key differences between the Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox Church. Now, you do not need to write all these down. Let's just list a couple that are really important. In the Catholic Church, the Pope has ultimate authority. In the Orthodox Church, they don't accept the authority of the Pope. And that should make sense based on how we talked about the role of the emperor. They don't accept the Pope. Right. Another key difference is that in the Roman Catholic Church, priests cannot get married. They're supposed to be celibate, which means no sexual activity. In the Eastern Orthodox Church, priests are allowed to get married and have a family. So the key thing to understand is just over time, they developed differences, and then that led to a split where they didn't want to be together anymore. The Byzantines did their own thing with the Orthodox Church. Everybody else who was Christian in the West stayed with Roman Catholic. So the other part of Chapter 9 is all about Russia and the development of Russia. And we haven't talked about Russia because it really didn't exist as a civilization until this time period. Russia on this map, the origins of Russia are the light pink color. Um, so Russia began when Vikings came from Scandinavia. So if you see on this map where we have Sweden, 
Vikings came over to Russia to start trading. And they started mixing with the Slavic people. The Slavic people are the ethnic group that were currently there. Um, and eventually developed a civilization that was first called Kiev. They developed important trading cities like Moscow and Novgorod, which we'll learn about later in the week. And they traded extensively with the Byzantine Empire. So the Byzantine Empire is just south of Russia. So the Byzantines traded a lot with Russia and through that sent a lot of their culture there. Because the Russian people up until this time, they weren't really very settled. Like not all of them farmed. A lot of them were still nomadic. They didn't have a large civilization. Whereas the Byzantines have a very developed civilization. So with, through cultural diffusion, a lot of Byzantine stuff went north. So key examples, Orthodox Christianity spread to Russia. That's one that you definitely need to know. So the Byzantines actually sent missionaries. These two guys here are Cyril and Methodius, who were missionaries from the Byzantine Empire, who went to Russia and taught people about Christianity. And Russia didn't have any kind of written language, and so they actually developed a written language called the Cyrillic alphabet, which is what they still use in Russia today. And the point of that was that they wanted the Russian people to be able to learn to read and write and therefore be able to read the Bible and learn Christianity. So a lot of Russian art and architecture looks very similar to the Byzantines because they were heavily influenced. People now like still watch their stuff. Yeah, and in Russia, now that has that changed a little while because Russia was under communism and so that kind of did weird things to the religion, but yes, their Orthodox Christian is their primary religion. Still? Yes. So Byzantine society, the emperors at the top, then we have the aristocracy, bureaucracy, church officials, so really very similar to other civilizations. Merchants and artisans are in the middle. Free peasants, who are people who are just farmers, own a little bit of land or rent land. Then we have two specific groups in the Byzantine Empire. The coloni are unfree peasants. So these are people who are not slaves, but they have a contract with a landlord that they have to work for him and they have restrictions over them. So they're kind of like in between being free and in between being slaves. So for example, a lot of times these are people who maybe had a lot of debt and so they had to give up their land in order to pay off their debts. They agreed to go make this contract with the landlord and work for him. They couldn't leave the farm without the landlord's permission, things like that. And then they also did have just regular slaves like we've talked about before. And um, like in other civilizations at this time period, the slaves were prisoners of war. A lot of them worked as household servants for wealthy people. So the Byzantine government over time offered the coloni, who again are these unfree peasants, freedom if they would join the military. Because remember, the Byzantines are constantly under attack. Um, and so they thought in order to build up their military, this would be a good system. And this is called the theme system. This also had the side effect because it prevented the landlords or the aristocracy from gaining too much power. Because the landlords started gaining a lot of power because they control all these people, the slaves and the colony. And so this was a way to kind of remove some of their power and give it back to the government. The Justinian's Code also regulated landlords to try to limit them from gaining too much land. And it prevented them from abusing their colony like they had to follow certain rules in their treatment of their workers. So the Byzantines had a series of peasant revolts throughout their time period that we're going to look at. Um, the free peasants don't own land, but they rent from landlords, and they're the ones that a lot of times revolted for different reasons. So a couple reasons. Um, remember, they're constantly under invasion. A lot of times they feel like the government doesn't do enough to stop the invasions, and so invaders are coming in and destroying their farmland. So they don't like that. They have pressure from landlords to give up any kind of rights they have and become colony or unfree people. 
They don't like that. And they also have, a lot of times, the heaviest taxes put on them, even though they're not wealthy people. And so they don't like that. And so peasant revolts were just a continuous problem in the Byzantine Empire. And generally, the Byzantines would send their military out and just try to crush the revolt. So last major thing is the economy. So Constantinople, why would it be a center of trade? We talked about that at the beginning. It's location. Yeah, it's location. It's right between Europe and Asia. It's a crossroads of trade. So trade routes like the Silk Road pass through there. It's pretty close to the Indian Ocean trade. Um, so it's just a really good location for trade. The government put a 10% tax on all trade that went through here. And so that's how they made a lot of money. They also issued currency, like we see here. They had lots of artisan production. So they produced things like textiles, ceramics, metal goods. They even tried to learn silk production, which was like a very closely guarded secret in China. They smuggled silkworms over to the Byzantine Empire and started producing that. They also had a very strong agricultural economy. So they produced lots of agricultural goods that other people wanted, um, like vegetables, grains, olive oil, wine, all kinds of things. And they're very active in the slave trade, which makes sense again because they're kind of in the Middle East. And we know there were a lot of slaves imported from like Central Asia, Africa, the Islamic civilizations got a lot of slaves. And so they were active in that trade also. So this just shows you um, kind of what trade routes they're connected to. You can see they're close to Mediterranean trade, Silk Road, and Indian Ocean. So what happened to them? They're frequently under attack by the Arabs from the Middle East. They're also under attack by the Slavs, who are the other Eastern European people. They're also under attack by the Turks, who are nomadic invaders from Central Europe. So lots of invasions are a problem. They also, over time, lost out on trade to Italy. And we'll talk later in the week about why Italy became a trade center. But they had more competition over time for trade. That might be a good way to say it. Increased competition for trade. And then they were finally fully overthrown after losing territory for a long time by the Ottoman Turks in 1453. Okay, we have a few minutes left, so what you need to do is go back and look at sources two and three. So sources two and three are both about Justinian, who we learned about in the PowerPoint. Go ahead and read sources two and three and answer the questions on the source paper. <laughs> 